Good evening, everyone. This is Cricket Lot for um, Monday, March 13th, 2023. And we have just had a marvelous raw food potluck with chuckle balls and a great basil avocado dressing and celery soup and cauliflower avocado mashed potatoes. And I don't know what that other salad was. Oh, and a pea and pea and peanut salad. And so all very good. You're sorry you're not here. And so we're going to um, start a show, a movie about um, eggs. So I'm going to share my screen. And we are going to start. Wait. I am the Weight Loss Champion, Chuck. Well, thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the exam room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. So here's the truth about it. We are in the middle of an egg. Some people say that the high levels of cholesterol found in eggs will stop your heart, and others will say that the cholesterol there, it won't raise your cholesterol for one little bit. Some say the protein found in eggs affects none. Others still will say it's way better to get your protein somewhere else. And now, on top of all of that, the FDA is debating whether or not to label eggs as an official health food. So really, like, what are we to believe here? Well, today we're going to be unscrambling some science with Dr. Neil Vaughn. That's Bonner. the highest it'll go. He's us here today, and if there's a question that you would like to ask him, go ahead. That's the highest the it will go. Wow. We're going to get to as many as we possibly can here on the show when we open up the doctor's mailbag. But let's not wait any longer. Let's talk about the incredible, is it really edible egg? For that, we welcome Dr. Farmer. Thanks for being here, my friend. Thank you, Chuck. Great to be back with you. So this conversation really started with a question that was sent in by Christopher. He's an exam roomie, and man, he was just as confused as millions of others out there. He was like, I have to know what is the score with eggs. My family says healthy. You guys say hold your horses. What is the truth about eggs? Are they healthy? The truth is no, they, they are basically cholesterol pills. Um, there is more cholesterol in an egg than just about any other food. It's highly, highly concentrated. That's for a reason. Because what is an egg? An egg, when it is laid, has everything in it to make a chicken. That's right. You know, the egg doesn't order out for room service. There's no more food coming in. Everything that it takes to make a chicken, the feathers, the legs, the beak, the eyes, the, the liver, it's all got to be in that egg when it's laid. And so that means it's got a massive amount of cholesterol because cholesterol is part of making animal tissues. And it's got some saturated fat, it's got some, uh, uh, some protein in it, but it does not have the things you need for health. Um, it doesn't have complex carbohydrates, it doesn't have the vitamins that we need. So no eggs, part of the problem, not part of the solution. Well, here's the interesting thing. People, they, they hear that, but then you have this other contention, like I was talking about a minute ago, who say, well, listen, that cholesterol pill won't raise your blood cholesterol. So where are they getting that information from? It doesn't seem to me to compute. It shouldn't compute. Um, there is something called the Egg Nutrition Center. The Egg Nutrition Center is an egg industry funded um, program that works really, really hard to try to make eggs look good. And so they actually fund many, many studies that look at what, what do, what's the effect of the egg on various aspects of health, including cholesterol. They publish a lot of studies on this. And their conclusions are, don't exactly match their findings. Here's what I mean. Uh, they'll, they'll bring in some people, they'll feed them eggs, and their cholesterol levels typically go up. In 80 or 90% of these studies, their cholesterol levels go up um, a little or a lot. But then when they get to the conclusion part of the paper, they say, well, the increase in cholesterol was not really significant or, or not so bad compared to butter or something like that. In fact, a couple of years, our team went through every study ever done on whether eggs raise cholesterol or not. Some of them were funded by industry, some were, were not funded by industry. And what we found, the studies agree that cholesterol is, goes up 
in response to EDX. Where the studies don't agree is that the ones that are funded by the egg industry tend to, to try to diminish that funding. They'll say, yeah, it'll go up, but, but not so much compared to meat, butter, something like that. And, and maybe the result is, isn't so, uh, so life threatening or something like that. Uh, frankly, dishonest. Uh, but the bottom line, the debate is over eggs raised cholesterol. That that study that you're talking about, when you guys you went back and looked at data, I think you started tracking it in 1950s. The studies that were being published. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. We really didn't start to see any egg industry funded studies until the 1970s. What happened in that era? And certainly more in the 80s and then the 90s. It really started to take off, if I'm not mistaken. What happened to cause them to say, "Hey, you know, we got to." start really changing the message here were they just not selling eggs what what was up yeah what really happened framingham massachusetts um became the site of the framingham heart study and this is back in the in just before 1950 they got started they rounded up a lot of people and they noticed that high cholesterol levels were associated with heart attacks as long as high, along with high blood pressure and smoking and so then the question was why do we have such high cholesterol levels and the first place to look was well which foods have cholesterol in, in them and so attention turned to eggs and initially, it was scientists who then, and not the egg industry, uh, but, but independent scientists who were looking at eggs. And the conclusion was really clear that you could bring in research volunteers, feed them eggs for four weeks, then take the eggs out for four weeks. And you could see while they're eating eggs, cholesterol levels go up. When they stop eating eggs, cholesterol levels go down. Uh, the egg industry became alarmed, and they did just what you said, Chuck. Um, after a number of years of getting hammered by this and having uh, health authorities say, well, Eggs raise cholesterol, we should eat fewer of them, limit them. Uh, the egg industry tried to fight back and they designed studies that uh, were rather tricky. Uh, starting in the 70s and especially in the 80s and 90s, and then today, really, the, the majority of studies on cholesterol are funded by the Egg Nutrition Center and, and uh, other industry allies. They'll set up these studies where they have relatively small numbers so they can say, well, the results weren't really statistically meaningful. Or as I mentioned earlier, earlier, they'll compare eggs to something else that's got a lot of cholesterol. So it, it doesn't look too bad by comparison. So how can you tell if a study has been funded by a particular industry, in this case, the egg industry? Is there some sort of disclaimer that they need to put on there? Yeah, there is. They, they'll tell me. Um, it's, <laughs> in fine, it's in fine print, but you can read it. Um, when you go through these studies, it will say right there, funded by the Egg Nutrition Center. Um, or, or whomever else. And that's the, they, they've been the ones who've been most involved. But uh, whoever uh, was funny, they'll know. All right, we're going to get back to industry influence in just a little bit, but I want to circle back to a couple of other things first. Um, we've also talked in the past here on the show about the enormous amount of cholesterol that's found in other animal products. Meat uh, is one of them. How does the cholesterol in an egg compare to, say, a slab of steak or a Big Mac that you might get from McDonald's? Well, the cholesterol itself is the same the same molecule. What's different about an egg is there is so much of it. Um, you'd have to eat a heck of a lot of meat to get the amount of cholesterol that you get from an egg. Um, but that doesn't mean that meat is healthy because what's even worse than the cholesterol is the saturated fat, the, the bad fat, which is in eggs, but even more so in meat and even more so in whole milk and, and milk products like cheese. The saturated fat, when you eat it, causes your body to make cholesterol. So they're both bad. The cholesterol in the foods, that's a problem, but the bad fat is uh, part of the problem too. So if somebody is rather fond of a weekend breakfast, steak and eggs, scrambled eggs with cheddar cheese on there, um, probably not the healthiest idea in the world. Heart attack waiting to happen. Uh, cholesterol, high cholesterol levels are clearly bad for your heart, and they are clearly driven, number one, by the bad fat. Saturated fat will raise your cholesterol. But cholesterol itself that you eat, it's not as if it just washes through your intestinal tract. When you eat that egg, the cholesterol goes down into your intestinal tract. It's then absorbed into your bloodstream, and it adds to your bone. About, about half the cholesterol in that egg ends up in your bloodstream. But some people might say, well, now, wait a minute, that may be so, but egg whites are a healthier option. What do we know about them? 
Well, the cholesterol is in the yolk. That's, that's right. And the white is just a big blob of protein. And up until about three years ago, we thought, well, okay, you know, at least there's not fat and cholesterol. It's just, it's just protein. But there has been this huge change that we now know that plant protein is superior to animal protein. What we mean by that is uh, Harvard researchers and researchers elsewhere started looking at different protein sources. And we had all thought that the eggs were a good protein source because, because of course, well, they got a lot of protein. But secondly, the protein they had is made up uh, of a pretty large dose of the essential amino acids, the building blocks of protein. Ergo, uh, egg protein has to be good for you. Same with meat protein, same with dairy protein. However, the researchers then said, well, if this protein uh, is so densely uh, concentrated in essential amino acids and the, the protein is somehow superior, it should have a health advantage. So they started looking at individuals and discovered that it didn't pan out that way at all. People who got their protein from animal sources die earlier than people who get their protein from plant sources. And it became very, very clear that if you swap animal protein, egg protein, or plant protein, and bring in the beans and the vegetables and grains, uh, your likelihood of dying is much less. Why? What we think is happening is that essential amino acids, while they are essential, you only need a certain amount. And plants bring you that certain amount. When you have beans and grains and vegetables and everything all together, you get all the essential amino acids and the amount of nature wanted you to have. If you have an egg, it gives you too much. It's just like uh, liver. Liver gives you too much iron, and uh, too much in these cases is, is really bad for you. So eggs increase mortality. Plant products are a better choice. But what if somebody's cooking the eggs, uh, if they're using them to bake something, right? You go to the bakery, nine times out of 10, the cake's there, they have eggs in it. You go down any aisle in the store, any product on the shelf, a lot of times that too will have egg in it. So when the egg is baked in or cooked into something else, does that still raise your cholesterol? Absolutely. It has exactly the same effect. It has exactly the same effect. The cholesterol is still there, the saturated fat is still and speaking of saturated fat, I really want to spend another second just kind of drilling this, this home. Is it possible to say whether that is more villainous than cholesterol? Is cholesterol the bigger villain here, or is it kind of an equal playing field? Uh, I think it's fair to say that saturated fat is the big villain, because when you consume the saturated fat, it definitely boosts your, uh, your cholesterol levels, but the cholesterol uh, that you eat does it too. Uh, but both end up in the egg. That's the problem. Uh, if you take that yolk and send it to a lab, they'll say there's a boatload of cholesterol and there's a fair amount of saturated fat there too. Take two eggs, they've got more than three grams of saturated fat. Now, with this being Heart Health Month, I also wanted to circle back here to cardiovascular disease, right? We're talking about a lot of things here that just clog the old arteries. Really not good for the ticker. Um, when it comes specific to eggs, I think we talked about this a little bit already, but let's hammer the point home just because it is February, it is Heart Health Month. What do we know flat out about the link between the health of your heart and the amount of eggs you're eating? Well, we know this, this is what we really have known ever since the training and study got started, and many other studies have confirmed it, that when, if you take a person who grew up maybe the way I did in the Midwest and we all thought that meat was good for iron and protein and eggs were for healthy protein and all this kind of stuff. If you take that person and you switch them to a plant-based diet, you get the eggs out of their diet, you get the meat out of their diet and so forth. What you see is their likelihood of having a heart attack goes way, 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 way down. Uh, their likelihood of having a stroke or other kinds of cardiovascular disease, it goes, it goes way, 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 way down. So all of these things, um, these cardiovascular risks are related to what we're eating and the eggs as well as the other animal products, clearly part of that equation. It's just, nowadays, there's no question about it. I hear you say that, and then there's more confusion piled on, because in 2015, the American Heart Association kind of changed their position on eggs. I mean, before that, they said, look, don't eat any more than three in any given week. And now they're listed as what they call, quote, a nutrient-dense protein source. So what happened in 2015 with the age of Actually, in, in the years running up to 2015, starting 2005, 2010, up to 2015, 
the egg nutrition centers studies started being uploaded were, were being published in a really high number and they were lobbying like crazy to say uh be nicer about eggs and stop criticizing them so much and in fact the dietary guidelines advisory committee at that time was heavily lobbied by them we put out a report saying well they weren't so worried about eating cholesterol because our egg industry friends say that it doesn't raise cholesterol levels too much and we actually met with uh, the decision makers at the Department of Health and Human Services and the USDA and had to talk with them. We went through the evidence and they, they changed their tune. And they, the, the guidelines that came out said clearly you should eat as little cholesterol as possible. Um, so uh, there, there's been just huge lobbying. But with the American Heart Association, there's another piece of it. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, Chuck. They, they have something that they call the Industry Nutrition Forum. It's an American Heart Association body. They set it up. And if you are a food company or an industry group, you can pay them $15,000 a year as dues, and you'll belong to the Industry Nutrition Forum. And McDonald's does that, and Cargill does that, and the Egg Nutrition Center does that too. And if you pay that money, what do you get? You get special access to the policymakers at the American Association. Now, they might say, I don't want to speak for them, they might well say uh, that they are not influenced by these industry groups at all. But I would, would personally question whether you really want to sell a, a welcome mat to, to the organization, to people who have products that are linked to heart, to, to heart disease and other things. Yeah, you, you emailed me a list of people who were part of that group last night as well um, that also were contributing to the American Heart Association and also on there, General Mills. Mars Wrigley, Quaker Foods, a lot of those highly processed, high fat foods that you and I talk about week after week here on the show. I don't think also, I mean, forget eggs for a second. I don't think that there is a lot of people out there that would say that a candy bar is necessarily going to be a heart healthy food either. And yet here they are, got their hands in the till of oh, yeah. the AHA. That to me is kind of mind boggling and it's concerning. This has been an area of huge controversy, and, and the American Heart Association has been hammered for it, but they're not alone. Uh, the, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has been uh, criticized a lot as well. When you go into to their conference, you see the dairy industry and various supplement organizations and, and, and the people who sell candy and every kind of food, but you want a dietitian not to say no to. They've got their money out of their time buying. So the American Heart Association, that's the that's really the name of the game. Now, different organizations are different. There are some that do not accept industry money. As you know, the Physicians Committee doesn't accept money from the food industry at all. And, um, and there are other organizations that have done that. The, the, American, the American Medical Association years ago, Green House, uh, back years ago, they had a program about cholesterol that was funded by the uh, Livestock and Meat Board, Meat Board, Board, Board as well. Um, and as time went on, the AMA realized this does not reflect well on us, and they threw them out, uh, and I'll give them credit. So when we conduct our studies, um, you know, Dr. Kaliova and her team, uh, including you, you guys do all of these wonderful studies. Where does that funding come from if it's not coming from big food? Well, back in 2003, I guess people know about our, our diabetes work that really hit prime time in 2003, and that was uh, we had uh, grants before that from private diabetes foundations, um, which uh, the Diabetes Action uh, Research and Education Foundation, we're, we're very grateful to them for funding that. But then in 2003, NIH kicked in, and they gave us uh, generous funding to do the hard work of testing different diets. And, and at that point, we tested a plant-based diet versus the best current portion control diet, and we're going to the results of that. Um, and our members have been very supportive as well. So our members may donate to, to this group, and many of them, and that's what keeps us going. Now, there are plenty of researchers, including really good researchers, who are really trying to figure out how to keep their labs running, and so they have their hand out, hands out to various food industry groups. And, and, and we haven't done that because we just feel that it's going to compromise our I, I don't mean to necessarily criticize those who do, but in our, in our case, we don't. No, but hypothetically, if there was a big broccoli group, right, and they came in and they say, hey, we want you to do a study about broccoli, even though we know that that's a health food, is that funding that the Physicians Committee would take? No, no, we can't do it. 
We can't do it. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, we're not able to do it. Um, uh, no, no, because because you, you don't want to be kind of Ouija boarding the science. So no, we, we don't take it. I like the way that you put that. Ouija boarding the science. <laughs> That's true. You know, and it's it's fair. I, I think that, you know, um, just a lot of some of the naysayers that, that may watch the show from time to time and, and want to throw their two cents in there, you know, they accuse us. Um, I don't know if they're joking or not, but I've legitimately seen people suggest that Big Kale is funding some <laughs> research. Or you, know, <laughs> or, you know, the carrot industry is the single biggest supporter of the exam room, which is hysterical. <laughs> um, but no, that's that's absolutely not the case. So yeah, thank you for you know, Chuck, Chuck, those people are right to raise that question um, because you, you do see that a lot. Um, and even with something that you and I think maybe not so bad, like uh, walnuts. Or walnuts healthy. Well, the Walnut Commission um, is very eager to meet the scientists, and so so that there are foods that you would think are, are healthy foods, but you still don't necessarily want them involved in your research. Um, so you, you want to be able to do your research and arrive at your conclusions without, without <laughs> having to have the food industry talk to you about what you want. The ethics of nutrition science. We can do a full episode on that alone. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag here. We've got a little bit of everything in there, including uh, we've got a kind of one here, an interesting one about eggs. And, you know, they say a lot, Dr. Barnard, everything in moderation, right? And so Pratip here is wondering whether a mostly plant-based diet that does have a few eggs, a little bit of fish and chicken could still be considered healthy. It is amazing how quickly you can ruin a good plan. Um, when a person, no, seriously, um, let, let's say you, you smoked for a long time. You managed to quit. You're not coughing anymore. Your shirts don't smell. Your, your fingers aren't yellow anymore. Everything's going great. Your doctor says, you're going to live a long time because you quit smoking. Um, and you say, well, what if I smoke just, a, just on the weekend? <laughs> just at a party. It is astounding how when you track risks, how the risk starts to go up very, very rapidly. The same is true with diet. So you've got the animal products out of your diet, but you say, well, oh, you know, that cheese was really good. Uh, so you, you bring it back in. And what you find is astoundingly the weight loss that has continued month after month now grinds to a halt, or your cholesterol level starts to go up. And then, so not only do little bits of these foods create problems, but also they do something with your head. If you ever had something that you were kind of hooked on and you've been away from it for a long time and somehow you give into the impulse to have to have a little bit of it, it's amazing how quickly you can get through and write that back down the rim. So those are really two good reasons to just kind of forget about the foods that don't want you back. The first is that they, they, they will hurt you even in small quantities, but also they, they tend to lead our habits in a bad way. We have a couple of people right now in the chat who are wondering, well, you said that baking the egg, you still get the cholesterol, but is there any way to cook it that would reduce the amount of cholesterol in there? Yeah, sure. Um, you well, you take the, take the egg and crack it out, put it in the pan and cook it thoroughly. Flip it over, you know, not sunny side up. Cook it very thoroughly. Then you take it, you put it on a small dish, cut it up in little bits and put it on the floor and let your dog eat it. Your dog oh. will eat that, that, um, that egg and you watch a carnivores that they tend not to get cardiovascular disease. Your dog. Well, I, dog I, knew, sir. I knew as soon as she said, yeah, sure, this was going somewhere. <laughs> I knew it. Oh, my goodness. Okay, uh, let's uh, change gears a little bit here. We talked about cheat. Why are you appalled by that? I mean, I eat eggs all the time. I'm just yeah, really upset. Too. I love the eggs. It's upsetting yeah. to do that in the dog. I agree with you. The thing is, I don't think he likes eggs anyway. Some people don't like them, but like me, they think they're gross. Because the way he said, then all you have is a big white blob. Well, I don't think that way. I think egg whites are great. Okay. But why are you upset you're feeding it to the dog? Because you don't get to eat it, or you think it's bad for the dog? No, because I don't get to eat it. Okay. That's what I want. <laughs> But you understand what he's been saying about, I mean, if you're eating a plant-based diet, eggs are not part of a plant-based diet. I do eat eggs. I'm not saying I'm a plant-based eater either. Are you going to say anymore? 
earlier with making a cheese omelet, essentially. Rita is wondering whether fat-free cheese could be a healthier option. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, look at the labels. Um, the negative part of the plant-based cheeses. Oh, well, I guess you're, Chuck, you're asking about two things. You're talking about animal-based cheese where they try to reduce the fat. Forget that. Um, that. That's still an animal product. But if you're looking at plant-based cheeses, look at the ingredients. The ones that have the coconut oil, not so good. Uh, the ones from cashews, healthier, and best of all, nutritional yeast, that gives you that uh, that flavor. By the way, while we're talking about um, replacements for things, check, how about if we say a word for a couple of replacements for, for scrambled eggs and things like that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, you've had scrambled tofu eggs, probably just about everybody has, has had it. And if you take that tofu and you scramble it up, and you mix in a little bit of, of that nutritional yeast, maybe a little mustard or uh, some pepper and some salt. It, I got to tell you, people, whatever fear they had of tasting tofu, uh, suddenly melts and it converts into you, you just love it because it's uh, it's so healthy. There's a new product out called Just Egg, and I don't know if you've had this, but um, it came on the market uh, a number of months ago, maybe a year or so ago. It's it's in a bottle. You pour it into your fry pan. Turn it on, and the ingredients are scrambled it like you would an egg. And you think, oh, this is, is this a bunch of chemicals, or what is it? It turns into what is, for all intents and purposes, a scrambled egg. So you look at the label, and it's actually made from mung bean protein, yeah. um, along with some, I believe it's canola oil. And that's kind of it. And it's, it, it does a really good job of simulating the egg. Not saying you need it, you don't have to have it, it is a commercial product, but. Uh, okay, the product is called Just Eggs. And it's mung beans are those little green beans. The seed is like that. And um, have you ever had um, sprouts on um, Chinese food? Bean sprouts. Bean sprouts on Chinese food? Oh, yeah. The, that's mung bean. If you know, Uncle Harry's coming over and he wants to grab the legs. He's <laughs> He's not going to know the difference. Uh, and Chuck, what, what convinced me on this one, I got to tell you, I was giving a grand rounds presentation at a hospital. And the, the, it was a cardiology program, and all the cardiologists were there, and they were listening to me. And then the, the chef for the hospital brought in the, the lunch buffet, which they always had after the lecture. So I thought, what are they going to serve? And here were two big bats of scrambled eggs. And we said, um, try them. See, see what you think. Let me know which one you like better. And so one of them had some little chunks of, of vegetables in it, and scrambled eggs, the other didn't. And so people waited which one they, they, they liked better. And then the, the chef had to say, I gotta tell you, there's not an egg in the food for one of these. He was using a just egg product. So I thought, you fool them, you can fool just about anybody, no cholesterol, no animal benefits. Anyway, it's, it's kind of cool when technology is on your side once in a while. That's very you know, cool. Uh, my wife, Julie. Loves that stuff too. Absolutely adores it. Um, she was she was one of the people who were blown away the first time she tried it. She's just like, there's there's just no way there's no egg in there, and there's not. It's uh, food science, man. It, it blows my yeah. mind. Uh, you mentioned there was a little bit of canola oil in there. We have a question from Lynn wondering about what may be a good oil for frying. Specifically, she's asking about grapeseed oil and avocado oil. Yeah. Of those two, I would pick the vegetable broth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chuck. I'm, I'm of those two, I'd pick the vegetable um, product. Oils, um, vegetable oils are cholesterol free. They're, you know, animal fats have some cholesterol in them, but the vegetable oils don't. But um, the, let's say you go to something like a canola oil, other, 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 they have much less saturated fat compared to chicken fat or beef fat or dairy fat. That's good. Mm -hmm. They don't have zero. They, they don't have, they, they're not free of saturated fat. Plus, they are not free of calories. So when it comes to calories, they are the same as lard. And so that's why a lot of people say, okay, forget the canola oil, the, the olive oil, whatever. And, and you can saute in vegetable broth, or some people saute in wine, or to tell you the truth, if you get a good nonstick pan, now, I'm not talking about the ones from the 1960s where the Teflon would like, scrape up, you know, and end up being there. <laughs> okay. The ones nowadays, um, let's see, the Demeyer is one brand, Made In is another brand. There are others too. Uh, they make a really good quality nonstick pan. 
And uh, that allows you to really put the ball well at all. And that's what I suggest. I suggest that people get away from the idea that you got to have oil in order to make food. You really don't have to. All right, oil, not necessarily healthy. Cholesterol, definitely not healthy, but fiber certainly is. We have a question from Jacob who says, with respect to fiber, does it matter whether you get it from a smoothie and you've blended it into what he calls a paste, or is it best to get it from a whole food? Well, both of the choices that you mentioned are better than eating. What was your question? She had no oil is bad. What did he say? He didn't, he said plant-based, so he didn't signify between canola or avocado or olive oil. But I agree with you. I've heard lots of bad things about canola oil. Yeah. Yeah, vegetable oil. My son said, don't buy that stuff. Yeah. I use the coconut oil. And when I'm frying, when I fry, I put a little water here on uh, here. Reverse osmosis when I use the good water and a little coconut oil. Mm -hmm. How I fry my stuff. Cool. Animal products. So if you switch to a plant based diet and you're having a smoothie as part of it, great, that's fine. However, what you'll often notice is that when you have it as whole food, if, if let's say weight loss is one of your goals, so discovery your weight loss is much easier when you're instead of having the smoothie, you're having whole food. And that's it's, it's kind of obvious why. That smoothie goes down the hatch in about like a minute and a half. Uh, the meal takes much longer for you to eat, and the satiety will kick in sooner. So the liquid calories maybe not not necessarily the best choice. That said, there are a lot of people who start their day with smoothies. They don't have health issues. It's entirely vegan. Not really a bad choice. Uh, fiber, lots of it found in beans. Kundan says, though, he has a little bit of trouble when he eats them. Matter of fact, he says, my health crashes when I eat beans. So should I quit them? Um, I'm not sure what the, the health crash is. If, if it's a question really of digestive issues, which for some people it is, um, two quick tips. First of all, there should be no al dente beans, meaning cook them until they're really, really mushy soft. Um, if you're cooking your beans only until they're kind of less crunchy, that's going to be a digestive challenge. So cook the beans thoroughly um, and then start with smaller portions. If you're eating this much steak, you might think, well, now I've got to have this much beans to replace it. Uh -uh. Um, a little bit goes a long way. So start small. Your digestive tract, your gut microbiome will start to modify, will start to change. And over time, you'll discover that you do really well with, with beans. Now, try different kinds. Uh, for some reason, you'll discover maybe pure black beans with some Mexican salsa, a little bit of jalapenos is great for you, maybe baked beans not, uh, or, or lentils are and some others. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit like the weather. So, uh, some are more digestible than others. But over time, what you discover is that you adapt and you can really improve them in your routine. They're pretty big way and really enjoy all the things. Michelle's been learning a lot about nutrition in recent years. She says she's been vegetarian now for about a year, but often feels tired. Wondering what can she do perhaps to increase her energy? Okie dokie. Um, well, first of all, just the basics. Before we even get to food, you want to make sure you're sleeping enough. And if you're not sleeping enough, look at what that might be. Um, if it's stress, well, you ought to win the lottery. Just kidding. Uh, we, we want to do whatever we can to diminish our stress and, and to deal with things that are that are interfering with our sleep. If it's something like coffee, that morning cup of coffee is still uh, delivering a little bit of caffeine into your brain at midnight. Uh, and it's it's very different for different people. Some people can have coffee into the day and they sleep like a baby. For many others, um, they're they're sensitive to the small amounts of caffeine in coffee, tea, and sodas. If if you're having trouble sleeping, get that out of your way. Alcohol, same story. You have a glass of wine, you feel a little bit sleepy, but then at three in the morning you wake up. Why? Because the alcohol in the, al the alcohol molecule is modified by your view body to what are called the aldehydes, which wake you up. So caffeine, alcohol, part of the problem. Getting into food, just a couple of very simple things. Um, if you are finding yourself tired after meals, look at the fat content of the meal. If you're eating things like guacamole and fried foods, the fat in those foods makes your blood 
it doesn't flow as well, it doesn't oxygenate your brain as well, and you find that you get sleepy. That's the, the Thanksgiving after uh, somnolence that many people have after that gravy filled uh, lunch that they had. So keep the, the grease out of your diet and see if that doesn't happen. Uh, with respect to caffeine, a lot of people think that over time they can kind of build up a a resistance or a tolerance to it is that the case yeah it is the case i mean you become tolerant which is why people are grouchy in the morning before they have a cup of coffee um that's tolerant so your body now says my new normal is to have a certain amount of caffeine in my blood all the time and at 6 30 in the morning you don't have any um and this happens very quickly but you can, but you can and, and what you'll discover is that your sleep might be better than it was when you were first having coffee but you'll still discover when you break a caffeine habit I know for some people that's five words, uh, but, but, you know, but you, you, you'll, you'll get to know your body. One, one last little tip that I just want to share uh, with the, 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 the roomie who said she's having trouble staying awake and so forth. You might try this. In the morning, if you start your, you start your day with some kind of plant protein, I know that some people start their day with fruit or toast or something like that or hash buns. These are not very high protein foods. Um, that complex carbohydrate that's now in your blood causes your brain to make serotonin. That makes you a little bit sleepy and you'll be sleepy throughout the day. If you have some plant protein first, it prevents the serotonin production. What do I mean? Go to the store and you get some tofu, get some tempeh, get some kind of vegetable, grilled patty, something like that. Uh, veggie sausage or frankly, just egg. Uh, and you have that first, and then you have whatever starchy thing or fruit you're going to have after that. You block that serotonin effect. You'll notice really two things. You'll notice that you're more awake, and if you are prone to grumpiness, you'll discover that that might be going to. Ah, there you go. The cure for the grumps. That's a good <laughs> thing right there. All right. Don't take my word for it. Give it a try. Uh, two more quick ones. Uh, first, from Bean Burrito. What is the best diet to increase testosterone? Um, I think the answer is in the question. <laughs> okay, um, kidding a little bit, uh, but not entirely. What, what does a bean burrito have? In? It's got a lot of fiber. Um, it doesn't have much fat unless you added fat to it. And as you're eating a high fiber, high complex carbohydrate, low fat vegan diet, you tend to lose weight. So what could weight have to do with testosterone? Well, testosterone in your body goes into fat cells. And within the fat cell is an enzyme. The name is an aromatase enzyme. This will not be in the test. But then that enzyme takes that testosterone that came into the cell, it converts it to estradiol, which goes out of the cell. So let me just walk you through this again so you're clear. If you're gaining a little bit of weight, your, your fat cells are not just dormant bags of calories. They are active factories that are doing work. And one of the things that they like to do is fat cells convert your testosterone into a female sex hormone, estrogen, estradiol. What can you do to boost your testosterone? Do not respond to television commercials and don't go on the website and buy things. Don't let your doctor tell you you've got low T. That is an invented disease. What you need to do instead is we follow a healthier diet that helps us to get rid of that excess body fat and that will help us uh, have the testosterone in nature and wanted us. Now, frankly, um, we don't want to have too much testosterone. There are people, athletes, who have injected testosterone for them in hopes of increasing their uh, performance or whatever. Uh, it does way more harm than good. I've got to tell you, in a modern society, we've got a little too much testosterone. So, bring that, bring, bring being burrito back in the diet, lose a little bit of weight, get your testosterone into the right zone. All right, and that's a great segue. Losing a little bit of weight here takes us home uh, to Paula. Last question of the day. Says uh, she's seen a lot about lectins with regard to weight loss recently. She's wondering whether it's necessary to eliminate them from your diet. Oh, I'm so glad you've asked that. Um, you see on TV programs that people talk about lectins that are in beans, for example, or in other foods. And it is true that if you ate beans raw, that you would get lectins in them that aren't so hot for you. But it when was the last time that you crunched down on a raw black bean? I mean, it doesn't happen. When you cook them, the lectins are no longer a problem at all. So the bottom line is lectins, not a problem. You're going to cook your foods normally, and it's not going to be an issue at all. So 
Thank you for that great question. You know, I'm excited. I'm absolutely excited. By the way, if we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. But Dr. Barnard, I am really excited. We've been talking about this for a few weeks, and with every passing day, the day draws near. March 30th, out in LA, the exam room live and in person for the very first time ever. We're going to be at the eBell on March 30th. You and I, we're going to be joined by Dr. Christy Thought, breast cancer surgeon to the stars, friend of the show, and she does so much to prevent that hideous disease, it's not even funny. And, and she does it like in the most fun and in a lot of cases, delicious way as well. So lots of energy, lots of surprises that night. Uh, March 30th, we'd love for you roomies to come out and join us. I know that we have a lot of exam roomies in LA. It'd be so good to be able to meet you. I'm so looking forward to this. This date has been circled on my calendar for a long time, my friend. I can't wait. It's going to be so fun to do this. We're actually all together in the same place. I really can't wait. Jim. Absolutely. So here's the deal. Tickets start at just $15 right now. You can stop now, right? You can slash events. You can reserve your seat today. $15 gets you in there, but there's also a... What's that? I'm saying, I'm saying I felt it. I had to watch it again. I mean, because... It sometimes you talk pretty fast on this. On this uh -huh. But I, I heard a lot more this time. Yeah. Um, so I'll put the link in the email for the replay and um, just look for the exam room. So if you didn't notice on the wall behind the one guy, um, this is by um, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And so that's Neil Bernard, several doctors that um, that we've had um, their cookbooks and, or their recipe books and that kind of thing. Um, what's the other big one that does um, Physicians Committee? Um, yeah, Joel Furman. Thank you. Yes, Joel Furman. He has a lot of recipe books, too. So. You can find those. They aren't all raw, but they're definitely plant-based. And that's the big thing for physicians committee is, and, you know, they have so, you know, obviously testimonies of all their patients that they've helped with heart problems and diabetes problems and all that kind of stuff. If you can find a physician that subscribes to that food theory then um, it will help you a lot more in your life. So um, anybody have any questions before I stop the recording on the, on the replay? I have two comments that I'm going to do when it gets changed. Okay. About canola oil is bad. Okay. And also about the cholesterol. Okay, hang on. Let me stop the recording here. Thanks for joining us. And we're going to stop the recording and... Um, Hope to see you in live next month uh, at the potluck.